Hello to our Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church listeners and others. This is our lesson for March the 1st, 2020, and it is from the Standard Lesson Commentary. This is uh, lesson one of five out of our unit one for the uh, spring quarter. And this lesson is entitled, from the Standard Lesson Commentary, A Call to Accountability. A Call to Accountability. And our devotional reading is the number 97 of the Psalms. And then our background scripture is the entire fifth chapter of the book of Amos. And our printed text is Amos, the fifth chapter, verses 18 through 24. And our key verse is the 24th chapter. I mean the 24th verse of chapter 5 of Amos. And it reads, let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And our lesson's aims are, summarize the misconceptions concerning the day of the Lord. And also explain why the Lord detested the people's worship rituals. And last, recruit an accountability partner to implement one lifestyle change to improve his or her obedience to the imperative of the key verse. And from our uh, standard lesson commentary, uh, we have uh, the introduction uh, to our lesson, uh, which uh, highlights uh, a certain significance relative to calendar days or days that different uh, religious assemblies mark on their calendar uh, for certain observations or for certain practices that are carried through the year according to a dating assigned on a calendar. And then we have the dismal day, also in scripture referred to as the day of the Lord, and then a disappointed God. And so in our lesson, uh, starting in the fifth chapter of Amos at the 18th verse through the 24th, uh, I would suggest um, this is uh, entailing a lot of background scripture. And to get a full understanding of the context of the lesson, uh, first, it would be good to read the background scripture, the number 97 of the psalm, and also the fifth chapter of Amos in its entirety. Now, as we read through the fifth chapter of Amos, we see the task that is before Amos, and we have a better insight or understanding of the severity of the assignment that was passed on to Amos. <clears throat> another issue or another concern that we should uh, be aware of as we indulge ourselves in the lesson also is, is that uh, Amos was selected to give a announcement, an alert to a people that he was not a part of. Amos was from the 
southern kingdom of Israel from Judah. And he was not from the northern kingdom of Israel. So he has, uh, shall we say, a message of doom and gloom and to a people that he is not a member of. So we can somehow anticipate the reception that he would receive, uh, even if he was a member in good standing of the people to whom he was assigned to give this message, the reception would not be one of welcome. Um, we ourselves, as individuals, many times uh, don't like to be corrected, especially when we think that there is nothing wrong with what we are doing. And for someone who we are not familiar with uh, to come and correct us and tell us that we need to change our ways, uh, even when loved ones, family members, or dear friends sometimes try uh, and inform us that that was wrong or you didn't say that right or you're doing something that you need to change, or I know the outcome of that path that you're on. Uh, we are not readily acceptable to changing our attitude or our behaviors or our thought process. Uh, we don't automatically receive correction uh, politely shall we say. And so here Amos is being sent uh, out of the area of Judah into the northern kingdom, Israel, and to inform them that God is not pleased with their practices, uh, with their governance or their behavior, and uh, I have been sent to give you a warning uh, to inform you that uh, if your actions are not changed, the day of the Lord will come upon you. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that we should uh, identify is, is that uh, Amos is a, a sheep breeder and a caretaker or a tender of the sycamore fruit trees. And so um, something that we should look at in comparison here is, is that in the beginning of the book of Amos, it tells us who the rulers are. And at the time that Amos is being sent, uh, Jeroboam and Uzziah are the two rulers in Israel at this time. And so one would raise question that, well, how come God did not assign somebody in Israel, someone that was well known, uh, someone that was a part of Israel, someone uh, that maybe would have had a better reception because they are a known individual and because uh, people maybe had faith or trust or respect for this individual and maybe the message would have been received uh, better and uh, uh, not uh, rebelled or retaliated against. Why did God send somebody from another region, another area, and then send them with a message of rebuke uh, to a people rather than some bring somebody from within 
their own rings or within their own company um, who possibly had a following or had uh, respect or honor or recognition in that grouping of people which maybe would have had a better reception. Well, when we look at this, we recognize through the lesson that uh, God is identifying through the words that he gives Amos to speak. He's identifying uh, certain behavior, uh, practices, and uh, certain forms of governance um, that are taking place. And obviously, uh, so many have been uh, silenced or so many have become a part of this practice until uh, God could not single out a individual among the group of the northern kingdom that uh, was suitable for the task. And another uh, perspective on this also is, is the practice of Amos. Amos is a, uh, a sheep herder. Amos uh, is not a part of, shall we say, a metropolis. Uh, he's not a part of a city uh, a population. Um, and therefore, he is somewhat removed. Uh, he's out, shall we say, not ostracized, but he is outside of the influx of merchants, businesses, uh, different assemblies, and the fixings are the uh, uh, the composure, uh, not the composure, but the uh, the arrangement of a city uh, environment or atmosphere. And so, when we look at how God makes God's selection, He chooses someone who is a not who's not a part of the general practice that everyone else that he is addressing is a participant in. He chooses someone outside of that who has uh, a uh, vocation or has a uh, daily function that removes him from the perplexities of the group of masses of people. And uh, shepherds have uh, a, uh, shall we say, a daily removal of the intermixing with a lot of different opinions and practices and beliefs and faith uh, and uh, 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 faiths uh, and also uh, behaviors and actions. Uh, he's in a more remote area where although he has a profession where he has to be attentive uh, to the needs of his flock, at the same time, he has the freedom and the connection with God's creation, with God, with God from a perspective of nature, and also the care of looking out for the best uh, pastures and the safety and prevention of harm coming to his flock, the flock of sheep. He also has a involvement with planting of seeds and the germination process 
of watching that which is planted and then seeing its harvest. And so there is a different character and a different makeup of an individual who has an environment that is different from the environment he's going to address. Now, the the first part of our lesson um, has a uh, subtitle uh, to it worded, Dismal Day. And uh, it is ahead of the first part or the first verse of our lesson, which says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? Uh, in other translations, it, it's uh, read, to what good is it for you? And when one thinks about the day of the Lord, uh, in the context in which we are addressing in our lesson, here, the it was perceived in Old Testament time that the uh, people of Israel uh, considered themselves that they were a covenant people and that they were the chosen people of God. And so in that uh, being established, then they felt that uh the presence of God would only be beneficial to them because uh, they considered themselves to be set apart and chosen. And therefore, they felt that the day of the Lord only represented that those who were not a part of that fold that those who were not a part of Israel, uh, many times uh, it has been said uh, by different uh, students or uh, different uh, teachers of the Bible that the Jews only considered uh, that there were two people. There were them, the Jews, and then everybody else. And so uh, they had set themselves apart from all people, all other people. And because of this, they felt that they were exempt from the judgment of God. And in our commentary, it also uh, highlights a certain um, uh, comment or statement which I think is good for our understanding and reading. And it says, uh, God's people considered themselves exempt from judgment on that day because of their status as his chosen covenant people. What prophets like Amos point out is that being the covenant people does not come without obligation. Elevated status before God also elevates the degree of accountability to him. True, God's unique relationship with Israel provides them with special blessings and privileges, but it also comes with a solemn responsibility for faithful obedience to him. The people in Amos's day had come to expect these privileges, but they had abandoned their responsibility. Therefore, our text opens up with the results of abandoning our responsibility and our part in the covenant agreement with God. And it says that the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Now, as we uh, address this, there are some uh, other passages of scripture that uh, we should read also 
uh, because uh, these uh, types of settings or these uh, occurrences uh, in the Bible are repetitive. Uh, a people uh, go in and out of our relationship with God. Uh, we do what we choose to do, and then we find ourselves overcome and overwhelmed with choosing ourselves as it is commonplace today. We have cliches and phrases that we use about I'ma do me or you do you. And then when we find ourselves consumed by doing me and doing you, then we want immediate relief. But we were compelled or we were alerted by the Spirit of God in the process of doing you or doing me that this was not in accordance with the will of God, but we chose to take that path anyway. And then when we found ourselves overwhelmed, we cry out unto the Lord, and then we want something that we've practiced for six months, a year, five years, ten years, we want it to be undone and corrected overnight. And so when we look at our lesson, uh, to give us a better overall picture of this, another place for us to read in addition to this, when we're talking about the day of the Lord, some other passages of scripture that we should also address to give us a fuller view of what our lesson is saying would be 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, uh, beginning at verse 1 and reading on through at least verse 9, and then also the 12th chapter of Luke, beginning at verse 35 and all the way through verse 48. Both of these passages of scripture uh, speak to the concerns of the day of the Lord and in Luke uh, referring to the second coming of Christ which also many times is uh, related and linked to the day of the Lord. So uh, these are familiar passages, but just to give us a clearer insight into what uh, we are speaking of when we uh, addressed the title or the subject of the day of the Lord. Now, the same thing occurs to the people who are uh, assigned as the recipients of the warning and also the participants of the wrong. The recipients of the warning and also the participants of the wrong. And for that purpose, I would like to read the beginning of 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. Uh, this speaks to those that have been enlightened, uh, those who have been instructed and taught uh, from the word of God compared to the non-believers. And it says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. These are those who are walking in the light and are sober. It says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman 
and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are the people of light and the people of the day. Now the text says the sons of light and the sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now, for the uh, concern of time, in your leisure, you should also read the 12th chapter of Luke, starting again, as I said, at verse 35 and on through 48. But again, it echoes uh, some of the same verbiage and wording that we found in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. It's telling us that the Lord is coming. But of course, those who are in the night or in darkness, uh, they don't believe so. And they always uh, try and respond by saying that I've heard that all my life about the Lord's going to get you and the Lord is coming and, and all everybody keeps saying that. And my great, great, great grandfather said it and they passed it down through generations and, and uh, you know, just this constant fear factor trying to control my life and tell me what to do and where to go and what not to do. And I'm just tired of hearing it. And so uh, I, I make my own decisions. And so uh, we have that kind of response by those who are still in darkness and don't know. Uh, but now uh, the good part, too, also of reading what the Word of God says is in the 12th chapter of Luke, as we get towards the end, I believe it starts at about the uh, 45th or the 46th verse, and it talks about those that knew what the master would do when he returned. Then uh, they were beaten with many more stripes, but those that did not know what the expectations of the master was, they were beaten with fewer stripes. And so it's good for our reading here. Uh, I lift that because it speaks to um, uh, the concern of those who innocently don't know. Uh, but those that are aware and have been alerted or warned, uh, then the day of the Lord, they should be fearful of. Now, uh, when we look further into our lesson and it talks about the dangers and it talks about it is as if a man was fleeing from a lion and then he ran into a bear. He went to what he thought was temporary safety into his house he leaned on the wall and then a serpent, a snake bit him. So then it says, uh, in relation to this, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? If we do not uh, avail ourselves to the teachings that bring us out of the darkness into the light of God, well, then, even when the wrath, even when the judgment of God falls upon us and we think that we can run from it and free ourselves from our just due, the uh, 
the wording and the scenario that was presented here tells us that we would run from danger to danger. So even though we fleed from the lion, we ran into the bear. Even though we thought we had a barrier set up, a barricade, we were in the safety of our home, we were even struck by a serpent in our own home. And so when the judgment comes, and as the last verse of our text tells us, and it says then that judgment run down as water and righteousness as a mighty stream. When we look at these parallels, uh, there is no hiding place for us. When God moves, there is no hiding place for us. Also, we want to look at uh, the disappointment. Uh, And um, I would like to reference um, some standard practices, uh, religious practices. Uh, In the book of Leviticus, it talks about, now we're talking here uh, in the 21st verse where God is speaking to Amos, telling him that I hate, I despise your feast days and I will not smell In your solemn assemblies. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Smell what? Smell the aroma of your burnt offerings. Offered unto God as a sacrifice for our wrongs. Now it talks about the burnt offerings and the meat offerings. Uh, So that we would get a better understanding, it would be good to reference the 23rd chapter of Leviticus. And in the 23rd chapter of Leviticus, it speaks of the seven, seven feast days that were required of the Jews to practice, uh, which were all uh, shadows of Christ. They all had meaning and they all had symbolism attached to them, which were embodied in the body of Christ. Um, When uh, Christ being the sacrificial lamb. And so when we look in Leviticus, there are three um, feast days that were assigned that all the males of the Jewish faith, they had to make this pilgrimage into Jerusalem. And those were the Passover and then the Feast of Trumpets, which was also uh, referred to as the Pentecost. And then the Feast, uh, it was also uh, called the uh, Feast of Weeks. Uh, And then it was the Feast of Tabernacles, which was also referred to as the end gathering. Now, these three pilgrimages, uh, pilgrimage, were assigned for all of the males of the Jewish faith every year they had to attend. Now, in northern Israel, in the northern kingdom, uh, when we look at these practices, Sometimes we feel that because we go through the ritual, because we follow the scheduled dates on the calendar uh, that we spoke of in the beginning of our lesson, when we go through certain um, common religious practices, that because we follow the routine of these scheduled uh, behaviors and actions, we sometimes uh, feel that that excuses us from the wrongs that we also are practicing along with our religious ritualistic practice. And what God had 
Amos to tell northern the northern kingdom to tell Israel was is that I'm not fooled by the fact that you still bring sheep and goats and bulls and oxes and burn them as a sacrifice for your wrongs. Uh, I'm not fooled by the sweet, savory smell. That doesn't uh, overshadow what I see going on. And again, when we talk about the judgments and the righteousness running down like water as a waterfall, the waterfall has no impediments. It doesn't have anything that hinders it. Nothing stops it. It's a steady flow, a mighty stream. Sometimes we see a current in a body of water and there are things that may be perceived as though they were embedded and would not be moved. But the strong current also moves large items. They may be abandoned uh, uh, vessels. They may be large trees or branches. But when the stream comes, when the righteousness comes, there is no strong obstacle that cannot be moved. And when we look back in the fifth chapter of Amos, it talks about these behaviors now that have warranted that now justice and righteousness will prevail. And when we look back uh, around about the 10th verse uh, of the 5th chapter of Amos, it talks about how there were those in high positions that took advantage of the poor, that they taxed the poor more than they should have been taxed, that they did not provide justice uh, for the poor, that they took bribes, they were paid off uh, at the expense of those who needed justice, of those that needed people who were in position that knew better, but did not do better and took advantage of the poor and took advantage of those that were less fortunate than themselves. So, when we get caught up into receiving our bribes and our kickbacks uh, because we misuse those that are less fortunate than ourselves and then think that we can fool the author of judgment and the author of justice and righteousness. God is not a man that he should lie, nor also is God a man that can be persuaded or influenced or fooled. So in the end, the justice, the just of God will prevail and it will reign. Now, our lesson concludes, and it speaks of a church. And this was during um, uh, the horrible transforma uh, trans uh, transportation of Jews along a train route. And many times the train would stop and the lesson concludes with a certain incident. Uh, a, a young Christian girl by the name of Diet Eman. Diet Eman. And uh, she tells the story of this train which stopped uh, hoarding uh, Jews which were being transported uh, to death. And it was outside of a church, a small church. And when it would stop, there were no uh, uh, restroom facilities on the train. And the uh, uh, people uh, were not fed and cared for. So they would be crying and wailing uh, because of the inhumane treatment they were undergoing. And the story talks about how the church 
uh, they were annoyed uh, at the noise. So they would sing louder to try and drown out the sound of the suffering of the people on the train. And it makes this analogy of is the church today sitting in communities and being annoyed by the crying and the suffering of the people that are around the assemblies of God? Is the church ignoring the sounds of the sufferings of the community that we are located in? And are we just going through the rituals? Are we just singing louder to drown out the sound and the cry of those that are less fortunate than ourselves? We hope that something was said in the lesson that affords us the opportunity to look at ourselves in this time and in this season and better apply ourselves to the will of God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.